Well, I thought, let me have a look at Enron's numbers. So this is Enron's headquarters, and that indeed is me. There's more of me and Enron again. And I'll start this off by saying that if you look at their street address, the first digit was a one, but after that, things went horribly wrong. <laughs> so, just a little bit of a story. This is Andrew and his wife, very happy, very wealthy, and life is going very well. There's Andrew a little bit later, and things are not going as well as Andrew had hoped. Uh, this was the auditor, uh, David Duncan, and when I watched these presentations, everybody absolutely good looking. It reminded me of the Weather Channel, which on the Weather Channel, only good looking people can tell you that there's a cold front coming from Canada. <laughs> Normal looking people can't possibly do that job. <laughs> Skilling. <laughs> on the day I left, I absolutely and unequivocally thought the company was in good shape. Uh, not everybody agreed. Uh, not everybody agreed there as well. Well, it's rather amazing that if you go to the SEC website and you look for Enron's numbers, they have actually removed the filings of Enron from 1997 through to the year 2000. I've never heard of the SEC actually removing a filing, but indeed they've removed it. So apparently it wasn't even worth the paper that it wasn't printed on. <laughs> These are the numbers that Enron restated, 97, 98, 99, and they restated 2000, and I got it in the nick of time before the SEC removed it. So let's have a look at Enron's numbers, and I've hauled out the important ones for you here. <coughs> These are what we call headline numbers, the really important one. Revenue, net income before the cumulative effect of accounting changes, and earnings per share. I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, my distinguished audience, that the digit zero is expected as a second digit 12% of the time and that it is reasonably key when looking at what we would call psychological thresholds. So uh, it's something that will change $990 into $1,000. So let's have a look at Enron's reported revenue numbers. 1997, 20 billion point two. He just makes 20 billion. 31.2, 1999, 40 billion point one. He just makes 40 billion again. I like that. I like somebody that sets a goal and says, I'm going to get it. <laughs> Finally, in the year 2000, 100 billion point seven. Three of them have a second digit zero. Net income, 105, there's the zero. 703, 1 billion and 24, there's the zero as well. And again, in the year in which Andrew let me down, the uh, revenue number didn't have a second digit zero. He still came through for me because the earnings per share, one dollar and one cent. So we have 12 headline numbers, of which seven have a second digit zero. And you can do the statistics yourself. You can say if something has a 12% probability of occurring, what is the chance that I get seven of them in 12 rolls of the dice? And you can use the binomial distribution and you will find that the probability is something to the effect of 0 .000 and then the digits will start. So very, very unlikely that this happens by chance. A few more things unrelated to the second digit zero. Watch this revenue number, $100 billion. The increase in revenue from one year to the next, 40 billion to 100, the increase in revenue is $60 billion. How many dollars is $60 billion? Well, it's a lot. <laughs> I'll give you a clue as to how big $60 billion of growth is. Microsoft's revenue at that time was $30 billion. Microsoft is a very large company. Microsoft has recently been sued and been fined by the European Union. Microsoft is so large and so powerful that entire continents sue Microsoft one at a time. <laughs> Enron's growth, their growth was equal to two Microsofts. Or stated differently, their growth was equal to Procter & Gamble plus American Airlines plus Nike. That was their growth. So this is all reasonably suspect. And again, we do have auditors that do have procedures. Now, I do have an email from Arthur Anderson. This is very, very interesting email. 
This is to David Duncan, the auditor, and it is from the people in the practice committee. And they talk about the fraud test results. It's difficult to read because these are from court documents, so it's intentionally difficult. This is a follow-up to a previous communication. We were unable to compute a model score because of the lack of SG&A data, that is selling general expenses and admin. However, upon further analysis, we determined that using a neutral value, so an estimate, would result in a red alert, a heightened risk of financial statement fraud. In other words, the values of the other indices shown in the attachment below are sufficient to generate a red alert. In this case, the particular values with the greatest impact are sales growth index and the gross margin index. So they knew that this sales growth was so large that it set off a fraud alert internally in Arthur Anderson. They knew it to be a problem, but what do you think happened? The auditor must have overruled things like this and gone through with reporting this revenue. This is, uh, this is dated October 2001. This is just before Enron restated. So Anderson were well aware that this rate of revenue growth puts them at a heightened risk for financial statement fraud. And indeed, it was one of the largest frauds were lurking there. I'm calling this to your attention to ensure that the appropriate evaluation and resolution is made of these results. So make no mistake, Arthur Anderson were not amateurs. They saw this and they knew that it had to be dealt with, but at this stage it's a little too little and a little too late. One more thing, because we are talking about ethics. Uh, you spoke about Enron, and so I want to keep to, to ethics here. Uh, this is an internal document again, with an, uh, this is the indictment of FASTAR. Enron required its employees to sign a confidentiality <coughs> agreement and to acknowledge compliance with the company's code of ethics. Confidentiality. Number one, you need to disclose your outside activities. In most jobs, you cannot hold a job and then do another job. We as professors have a special exemption, so we do are allowed to do some consulting or, or book writing or things like that on the side, but that falls within the ambit of what we're allowed to do. Uh, what they say, Fastow signed the confidentiality agreement and he signed that he was in compliance with their code of ethics. However, that was untrue. Fastow had dealings with these special entities that Enron created and he was making a profit on the side from these partnerships. So he knew that he was breaking their code of ethics and on top of it he signed that he hadn't broken their code of ethics. Department of Justice. Fastow, uh, that exactly will do it to you, sentenced to six years in prison for his role in the conspiracy. Da -da -da -da. And now I do just want to make one point and it's a rather serious point. When somebody is indicted for a crime, it is not necessarily that which you get sentenced for. The sentence in the end will be the result of a plea agreement and we agree this and we agree that and you agree to plead guilty and we'll sentence you. It's all the result of agreement and in the end he was only sentenced for two counts of conspiracy to commit securities and wire fraud. So, rather serious. He was only sentenced for conspiracy. <coughs> That's a very specific legal, legal term. Conspiracy to commit securities and wire fraud. So in the end, everything was really watered down, and that's what he was sentenced for. However, the original indictment was for 98 counts of fraud. So from 98 down to 2, he did reasonably well. Not as well as he would have liked. You can go onto the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and they have a website. It's a lovely website. I'm sure lots of people go there very regularly. <laughs> Over there is inmate uh, located. Exactly, we'll do it to you. Uh, projected date of release, 2011. So you can go on, you can type in Dennis Kozlowski, and you'll see all the names there. Or Uncle John, if, <laughs> if that happens to be.